of uh, 2 Peter. And tonight we're looking at verses 11 through 13. And uh, let me just read the passage and then we'll jump in here. Um, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> trust is an interesting thing. What and whom we choose to trust is dependent upon a variety of factors. For example, when, when I was teaching at the junior high, I learned early on that to a great many people in the school, in the community, uh, music festival was the big deal. I remember at my first uh, music department meeting in September of the first year I was there, a teacher asking me, one of the other music teachers, do you know what you're going to be doing for the music festival? I was like, when is it? And I said, oh, it's at the end of April. And I, I'd like to say I didn't make a face like, what is wrong with you? That is what I thought. I said, no, I haven't decided on that yet. I mean, I have never been that much of a forward planner. But it was a big deal for many people. Um, and for whatever, I mean, whether it's the way it ought to be or not, I mean, if you could succeed at that as a, as a band director, you could be subpar the rest of the year. <laughs> Just do a good job there. People were happy with you. Uh, for many reasons, musical, educational, otherwise, I was able to do a good job at that concert. And after a few years, it almost became like a monkey on my back, thinking of ways to keep upping the ante, so to speak, for the next year. But I remember there came a point in the preparation phase where I stopped being so concerned because I would just tell my kids, we'd get ready for music festival, and I'd give them something that they didn't think they could really do or that they didn't think was going to work or wasn't going to be as good as last time. Because that was another thing. Those kids would come in like they'd seen the ones before, and they're like, oh, we've got to do something about it. But I reached a point where I could just say to them, oh, I, you know, I just want you to know something. Whether it's justified or not, People have come to expect that our band is going to be great. It's going to be a highlight of the night. And if they're, if it turns out that it's not that way, they're not going to blame me anymore. Because I've already proven myself. Now they're going to blame you. If it works out great, I mean, that's awesome. But if it doesn't work out so great, it'll be on you. So you might want to work a little harder on this. <laughs> and that worked because I had achieved a level of trust with the audience and then I achieved a level of trust with the kids. They were willing, they got to where they were willing to try almost anything because they knew it had worked out before. See, that's the way we trust. For, for most of us, trust is based on a track record. It's really too true that most of us are really pretty fickle. And the trust can evaporate if there's a problem. But until there is, we can trust based upon past performance. But what this means is that it's easier to believe a thing can happen again than it is to believe a thing can happen the first time. It's easier to believe it can happen again than it is to believe it can happen the first time. And I think maybe that's where the uh, churches were in regard to Jesus coming back. Verse 11 said, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And as we know, long now, you can, it's really hard to start a passage with the word therefore. So we'll back up a little bit to verse 10 as a springboard to 11. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Now, I said we shouldn't start with therefore. 
And then I start with verse 10, which starts with the word, but. At some level, though, we do have to just jump in. Uh, we've learned that the false teachers were really known for their ideas that, contrary to popular and apostolic opinion, Jesus really wasn't going to come back. I mean, that's what, that's what they were teaching. That's, that was the, 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 the crux. That was the problem. They were teaching that Jesus, he wasn't really coming back. He'd have done that by now if he was going to. And to support their argument, they had their own limited experience. Well, I haven't seen any sign of it yet. Therefore, I declare it won't be happening. If you're going to make your argument based on something like that, you just be prepared for a lot of people not to uh, think you're that smart. Because that's not a great argument. Because I said so. Because I just made it up. Because I want it to be that. I mean, okay, but there, there ought to be more than that. But these were charismatic people. And this wasn't the only thing that they were doing. I mean, they were false teachers because they had this problem, but they were teachers. They were Probably there was a lot of the gospel that they were getting right, which is part of the problem. When you get most of it right, then you throw in a little bit of that, and then people are like, well, I really like them. I mean, there is that one thing, but, but you know, in so many areas of life, we'd never tolerate that. I mean, if you went to go buy, I don't know, a milkshake at the Dairy Queen, and you knew it was 95% good, you would not accept it. <laughs> I mean, it's 16 ounces of goodness and then one more ounce. You wouldn't want it. But these people were making, they were getting through. And frankly, that still happens today. You know, they, I've got all this truth and then I throw in some non-truth. That's a great ploy. Satan loves to do that. I mean, Satan uses scripture. Scripture is truth. But then he finds a way of, you know, slipping in some other things. So <clears throat> if you, this one point, though, that they're making, that Jesus isn't coming back. You go back over the material we've looked at, and really you don't see any scriptural backing for this view. They do not give it, I mean, it's not presented that they have any scriptural backing. So that has to be for the committed follower of Jesus. That has to be a big red flag. You have, all of you, have strong opinions about some things that are not scriptural. But you, I'm, I'm pretty confident that you don't let those things rise to the level of scripture. You might like a certain kind of food. You might root for a certain team. You might like to order your house a certain way. And you've got strong opinions about that. You might have child-rearing opinions that differ from one another. But you're not saying this is scriptural. I mean, or this is at the level of scripture. These guys were taking a scriptural thing, Jesus coming back, and then they were pulling at it and saying that's really not the way that is. They weren't just like coming up with something out of the blue and saying, hey, and by the way. No, it was something that was already there. Um, if we hear teaching today that we're not sure about, that otherwise biblical teaching, that we're not sure about, or even if we are really, I mean, we should do the Berean thing and search the scripture and make sure that, you know, everything's still cool that way. There, it's possible to be a good preacher and not be scriptural. If good preachers mean you're entertaining, engaging, a good orator, you're just a good speaker. I mean, there, I've been to any number of teachers' meetings and things where, you know, there'd be a speaker that was engaging. They weren't preaching. They were engaging. They were entertaining to listen to. Though, frankly, not many teachers' meetings were entertaining. Uh, but anyway, 
Um, it's going to be hard to find a lot of scriptural support for a concept that Jesus is not going to do something that he said he was going to do. <laughs> so you'd think this would be a non-starter. But we as people, I'll, I'll include myself in this for humility's sake. We as people find ways of being dense sometimes and with just being like, how could you think that? Every The next time you think about somebody else's idea, the next time you think, how could you possibly think that? Just know, given the opportunity, there's people that would think that about you, about something. Because most of us have something that we think that we, you know, we kind of hold to, and other people are like, what in the world? The problem is, this rose to the level of something Jesus said he was going to do, and they're saying, that no, it's not going to do. See, Peter says, accepting all of that, knowing that God actually really is going to do what he said he would do, that everything we see will one day be no more. Remember, you go back a little ways. We're kind of taking this in little bites, but you go back a little ways, and we talked about this. They made, they were kind of making the statement, well, everything's the same as it's always been. Every, it's just the, you know, one day comes and the next day goes, and it's just, you know, things don't change. And Peter's argument against that was the flood, you might recall. Well, one day it was, everything was cool, and then there was the flood. So it's happened at least once. Peter's saying when Jesus comes back, it's not just that he's coming back and everything's cool. It's like earth-shaking time. And so Peter says, if that's really going to be the case, if God's really going to do this thing, if everything you see will one day be no more, what kind of people should that make us? I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, it should be. Peter is saying that what we believe should affect the way we live. I wonder if he would go so far as to say that what we believe always affects the way we live. It does. What you believe always affects the way you live. For example, if you believe that people are here, here being on earth, if you believe that people are here as the result of millions of years of evolution, then you have accepted that scripture is in error. It's in error. And you have further accepted that people really are just a cosmic happenstance. Now, I'll, I'll just pause right here. I know there are People that claim um, to be scriptural Bible believers that want to say things like, well, no, no, uh, see, evolution, yes, but God directed the evolution. Okay, except that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> I, I mean, there's just not this, there's not the, the support for it. If you want to have a full-on conversation about that. And I don't mean like where I'm getting on you. I mean like if you want to know more why I think that way, I'd be happy to tell you. It's just not the time frame now. But if you believe that, you've accepted that as you've accepted as fact that because of evolution, people are improving. That's what evolution is. Things are getting better. All that being true, if that's really the case, well, we don't really have to worry that much about what comes next. I mean, if evolution is the rule of life, then the strong will survive, and frankly, we don't have to be that worried about the weak because it's survival of the fittest. I mean, if evolution is really true, that's what that is. If there's no God, well, no, well, pastor, nobody said anything about no God. Okay. Well, if there's a God that's either lied to us about his intentions 
or a God that's powerless, excuse me, to accomplish his goals, we can kind of do whatever we want to. We can see how that works. I, I feel strongly about this evolution thing for because I believe it is scriptural and I believe it is that evolution is illogical. I used to ride to work with a guy that lived in Iliopolis for about a year and a half. He had a hand-me-down car from his parents. You'd think that a grown man would be driving a hand-me-down car. But since his mother was a neuro, uh, his father was a neurosurgeon and his mother was a psychiatrist, he was driving their Jaguar. <laughs> and it was pretty slick, let me tell you. But the weeks that we traded weeks, we'd ride the Jaguar. I remember one time thinking, we're driving down the highway on 72, and I thought, I thought we're, we must be doing like 50. What are we, like, you need to speed up because it was just so smooth. And I looked over and we're going like 85. That thing was solid, solid car. Anyway, one day we were talking, and uh, he was a science teacher, so that would have made him sort of felt obliged to believe in all these things. So I was just asking him some questions, and I said, I mean, I said we we talked back and forth and back and forth, and I finally said, okay. I said, you're wearing a wristwatch, yeah. He said, okay, so if I were somehow to get that watch and I were to take all of the pieces apart, every single piece, not two pieces left, connected, and I put them in a box and shut the box and I shake the box, is that going to result in a watch given enough time? And he said, well, yeah, given enough time. And I just laughed and I said, he's like, well, given millions of years, anything could happen. I said, uh, that's not very logical. You can shake that box all day long for millions of years or not. Not making a watch. <laughs> just not. So if we thought that though, <clears throat> It's going to affect the way we live. It's going to affect the way we think, as a man thinketh. It's going to affect the way we live. Peter says, if God is trustworthy and he is coming back and things are going to change, well, then it absolutely should alter how we live. And, and what will or what should that issue forth in? Well, Peter's pretty clear, pretty simple. A holy lifestyle, holy conduct and godliness. That makes perfect sense. If there's a test that counts for something, you better study for that test. We talked about that already. You know, if you come in, the teacher says, hey, uh, we're going to lecture today and tomorrow, but really there's not going to be a test. So, well, guess what? Nobody pay attention to you. They're not going to do it. But if there's a test that counts for something, in fact, if there's a test that counts for everything, every year the eighth graders have to take the American Constitution test, and they believe a lie, the lie that says, if you don't pass this, you're not going to get out of eighth grade. Yes, well, I've never seen somebody get that yet. Because mm -hmm. they'll let them take it again, and maybe again. But if they really, if it, kids believe in that lie, and they get, you know, that's a test they study for. I'll, I'll tell you another test they study for. There's one test in high school that I guarantee you kids study for. You know what it is? Anybody, any guesses? Driver's Ed. Because they got a feeling if they don't pass that, they're not going to get that, that uh, license. So that test matters. So they study. Even kids that don't study for anything, they'll study for that one. If a test counts, you better study. And if there's a judgment coming, you better prepare for it. I think ultimately, we're not really saying either there is a God or there isn't. I don't think that's what we're saying. I don't think that's what people really ever say. I think they use those words and kind of phrase it that way, frame it that way, but I don't think that's really what's happening. I think we're just constantly in a discussion of 
whether Jehovah is God or I am. It's not whether there's a God or not. There's always a God. There's always a God. Even atheists, I don't believe in God. They believe in something. In fact, they have a lot of faith. They have so much faith that they think you could put a box full of watch parts in a box and shake it, and eventually a watch will come out. And the fact is that the, the, the human being, anybody would tell you, is infinitely more complex than a watch. And yet somehow, magically, within millions of years. That's a cop-out, but it's faith. It's a statement of faith. I know there's no God. Well, then you must, have, you must be God then because you can't, you have knowledge of the entire universe? You must, so the question is never whether there's God or not. I know some people think that is the question. It really isn't. So, um, do people, the people that know us, not you all right here, we're going to be pretty confident with each other, other people, do they get the idea from the way we live our life that we believe something different than they do? I talked about that on Sunday a little bit. If, if, I mean, the snapshot, you can make anybody believe anything with a snapshot. If you don't believe me, wait till we're done and I'll show you some Instagram and Facebook posts. I could make my house look like Better Homes and Gardens or whatever house magazine you want with the creative use of snapshots. Look at realtors. You take some pictures, you look at the re the pictures that people put on Zillow or wherever you want to look at houses and they're like, this place is fantastic. And you get there and you're like, okay. I mean, it is the same place, but the camera sure made it look different. If people look at our lives, not the snapshot, but like the reel, the movie reel that just goes and sees everything. It's the panorama, and they get to look around the corners, and they get to look at, you know, the early morning, and the late at night, and the days I feel fantastic, and the days nothing's going well, the days that I win the prize, and the days that I have all flat tires on my car. If they look and they examine my life, should they be able to see that I believe something different than they do? I'm pretty sure, though I've never heard it phrased that way, I'm pretty sure that's called holiness. I'm pretty sure that's called sanctification. You're committed to God that, like, even if, if everything is wonderful, I'm serving the Lord. And if I'm sick on every other day, I'm serving the Lord. That's called sanctification. If all my kids rise and call me blessed, I'm going to serve him. And if they won't even rise to get up to get their phone to text me, I'm still going to serve him. Yeah. That, I mean, people ought to be able to tell by the way we live that we believe something different. <laughs> they should. Verse 2, looking... Wait, not 2... 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Now, I know that's a sentence fragment, but uh, that's interesting. We look for the day. We get that, I think, even if sometimes we get too wrapped up in the right now. We should be looking to the future. Don't you think Christians should be like the greatest optimists ever? I think so. I know there are other factors at work, but optimists are generally far more attractive and persuasive than pessimists. 
I'd rather hang out with an optimist of any sort than a pessimist of any sort. Even when I am feeling like, may, I'm pretty optimistic most of the time. Some would say I am uh, naive and idealistic. Even on days when I'm feeling crummy, I'd still rather hang out with an optimist. I never felt better for seeing somebody think how terrible things were. I know there's other factors at work, but I think that's important for us. Optimists are positive people. Who more than a blood-bought believer of Jesus Christ should be an optimist? I mean, we look forward to the day that Peter's describing here. We long for it. But it's interesting. Look what else Peter said. He said that we have a role in the timeline. We talked last week about the fact that no one knows the day or the hour, and we stand by that. But Peter also says, we can speed things up. We can speed things up. We can make it happen faster. How? Well, by living the way we should and by spreading the gospel. We can move the clock forward. In other words, God is factoring in his people's actions into his eternal timeline. That's amazing. I mean, that's what the scriptures say. Hastening the day. I know we don't use the word hasten too much in our everyday word and language, but it means to hurry. When we look at the rest of the verse, it might make us nervous, I guess. All that talk of dissolving and fire and melting and fervent heat. I mean, that kind of sounds like something we all came here tonight in part to avoid. But yet, rather than hang right there, we'll move on to the next verse and see if there's any relief from that. Verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, according to his promise, remember what I told you about trust? Remember when I said that I felt that people had come to trust me because I'd proven myself over time? I'm here to tell you that is even a little bit true with me. It's true a billion times over with Jesus. Where, where has he ever been shown to be wrong? I mean, you think about it. You look at the Bible. I see the place where Peter, or Jesus says, hey, Peter, go down to the lake, throw your line in, first fish you catch, bring it up, look in its mouth, there'll be a coin there. You pay your taxes in line with that. That's pretty specific. <laughs> That's not like, I got lucky with it. Whew, I'm sure glad he caught the right fish. No, what are you talking about? That's creator level stuff there and easy to prove that he was wrong. There were always other people around. In fact, when he said that, wasn't that where they came to him and said, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? They were trying to catch him. They heard him say that to Peter. You don't think they sent people to find Peter so they could say, see, it didn't come true. But I never see that part. No? A fellow's going to town, and you're going to see their young donkey. Uh, if anybody bothers you about it, just tell them the master needs it, and then bring it back here, and it'll be all okay. It'll be all right. Uh, and it, they did it, and it was just like that. And somebody said, hey, what are you doing? Uh, the master needs it. And they didn't say, I don't care. Who do you think you're master? No, they, okay, well, that's what I thought. It all worked out. He says to, to Mary and Martha, your brother will rise again. Well, that's easy to prove whether he was right or not. Again, there were enemies there. There, there were some that plotted to kill him after they saw Lazarus rise, but they didn't go away saying, if this fool said they were going to rise and nobody rose anywhere. He called, but nobody came. No, they killed him because he did do it. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. They, that was one of the reasons they were upset with him. They brought that up in his so-called trial. But yet on Sunday morning, <laughs> the tomb broke open and he wasn't there. He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me. See, he's trustworthy. That one hasn't happened yet. But those others all did. So why would you ever doubt? Even on days when it's like, some days it's crummy. Some days 
some days that, you know, I want to pick up the phone and say, Jesus, can you come get me? I don't like it here anymore. Come get me. But it's going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. And we can rely on this because of all that he has said he does. Peter says uh, here that we look for new heavens and a new earth. That language that he that uh, he mentions that, that comes from Isaiah 65, verse 17, which says, Behold, I, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. So <clears throat> how have all that happened? I don't know. Some commentators look at what Peter is talking about here and they say it's transformation. Everything that we see will be changed. It will be transformed. They see fire as like the purifying agent. It makes sense. Um, so they're saying, you know, this planet, this planet will be made new, you know, and it will be transformed. Okay, others see Peter's language and they say, no, what he's talking about is replacement. What we have now, it'll be gone. It'll be eliminated and new will come in its place. I, I get that talking about this might make us a little nervous. It might make us nervous in that, you know, people might think we're just off the deep end a little bit talking about this kind of stuff. However, I remember just a couple of weeks ago when all the talk on the, uh, the American news was these Chinese balloons and assorted objects. I remember a general, the Joint Chief of Staff, talking about, well, if they're aliens, this is who we've got protecting us. They're talking about maybe they're aliens. What the? <laughs> okay, so maybe I don't have to feel bad that I'm taking the Bible and saying, you know, well, someday this isn't going to be here because the world's got their two key ideas too. Uh, this also puts me in the mind of something that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. This is from chapter 8 of Romans. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation, yes, you were created, but this is really talking about like the natural world, the creation, er, eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So a creation's like suffering because we sin. And it's going to be different. Paul, is, through the Holy Spirit here, Paul's saying, yeah, that's, it's just like what Peter said. I don't know how it's all going to work, but I do trust that it will. I mean, I've told you before about my dad. When I was a kid, he'd take me places. I never once felt the need to check on him to see if he knew where we were going or how, we, you know, how we'd manage. I, I never felt the need to keep asking him, hey, are you sure that's the right turn? Mm -hmm. In fact, I never, I don't, I never remember asking him. I've told you about being in Canada on the lake when everything looks like, it either looks like water, a pine tree, or a rock. <laughs> everything. And dad would be like, now look over there. You see how that's like, an, not really. Well, that's the mainland, and this is, you want to head for that, and then you go, and I'm like, we never got lost once. I never felt the need to ask him, Dad, are you really sure about this? No, because I trusted him because he proved himself trustworthy. And if he was, well, God certainly is. So we can relax. We can live a holy lifestyle and thereby speed things up. So like on the days, I guess maybe, maybe part of the takeaway is in the days when you're like really ready to pick up the phone and say, Jesus, come get me. <laughs> We just look, we make sure our lifestyle is holy that day, and it'll help speed things up. I mean, that is what the scripture says. I don't think I'm taking that out of context other than the phone. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word to us. We know we can trust you, Lord. You've never proven to be found false. 
And, and so even on days when we all, frankly, sometimes we were tempted to doubt. We thought things would work out one way, and they just didn't. And there's those days when we do kind of want to pick up the phone and say, can you come get us? We're tired. I don't like it here. We know that you are going, you've got things under control. Even when things don't seem like they're under control, you got this. Help us to trust you. Help us to know that we can trust you. Help us to live a holy lifestyle, knowing these things are going to happen. These things are going to come. And how, how grateful we'll be for time and eternity because we took you at your word. I pray that you would encourage the ones here tonight that need your special encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming tonight.